And welcome back. This is lecture number three of Criminology, third edition, chapter seven, by Frank Mal Smaliger, Pearson Publications, Pearson Education. So we left off talking about social control theories of various uh, suggestions that uh, we all have some type of deviance going on in us, and the only reason we don't do it is because of the controls that may be internal or external to us that keep us uh, in check or contain us, if you will. And we talked about control balance, we talked about containment, uh, social bonds, those, those things that, that we're like attached to or involved with, uh, the beliefs that we have, and uh, the commitment that we have that all give us these things where we're, we're more motivated to do the right thing than maybe doing the wrong thing. But the suggestion in control theories is that is that we all may have this penchant or whatever, if you will, to to do the negative, and it's what it's what is in place that stops us is is the control. So now we want to look at at now is the next theory is called labeling theory. Labeling theory is very interesting because, and it's one of the critiques you're going to find out is it doesn't really explain why crime occurs in the first place. It blames that person's continuing criminal behavior on the fact that the state or the government or whoever it was has labeled them. So let's, let's take a look at it. All right, labeling theory. So response, so society's response to known or suspected offenders determines the individual's future. That's what labeling theory basically is, is, is how the government responds to, to someone's behavior is going to determine what their future incidents of criminality, because it reduces their options. So the suggestion of labeling theory is because someone's labeled a criminal, whether it be a burglar, a robber, a rapist, or whatever, that keeps them from being able to grow in a positive way in society. That's what basically what labeling theory is all about. And it, what they call the labeling is also called tagging, not to be confused with what your, what your graffiti artists or gang members might do out in your neighborhoods or anywhere for that matter, because they're all over the place. It sometimes amazes me how they get up on these uh, towers and how they get on bridges and stuff. That's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is laying a tag on a person. If somebody is, is arrested, and what happens when somebody's arrested? In, in many communities, especially smaller communities, every single arrest is released to the local uh, newspaper at the very least, and the more serious offenses wind up on, on the television news. So there you got an arrest, and someone is labeled. Now, it's kind of hard to take that back when someone is arrested. And they may even go through the entire court process and get acquitted in the court, and yet, Everybody heard that this person was arrested for this crime, so people automatically associate their name with the crime. That is a tag. Uh, one community nearby me was actually posting pictures of individuals that were arrested. Not people they were looking for, that's different. People that were arrested, their pictures were posted on their Facebook page. So now, not only are you, is your name out there, where you know, people who don't know you, they're not gonna see you on the street and say, hey, that's Johnny Jones, the guy that just got arrested for DUI. No, but if your picture's in the paper or your picture's on Facebook where everybody gets their news these days, well, not everybody, but some of you are getting your news these days and you see Johnny Jones' picture on Facebook and you see them in the shop right or the 7-Eleven or the Wawa or whatever, hey, there's that guy that got arrested last week. That actually, people, people contested that, they fought it, and the department uh, changed their policy. But there are sheriffs and police chiefs all over the country who feel that shaming, which is an extension of labeling theory, is shaming someone is, is a way to deal with, with crime. That if you, if you put them out there, people know that maybe they're, they're less likely. Well, labeling theory says just the opposite. So you have the person who's arrested may or may not get convicted. You have a certain person who's convicted of a crime. Now you have a stronger label. So, okay, 
we went through the entire court process and we found this person is guilty. Now they still have the potential to appeal, but how many people follow appeals? You know, you hear about in the news that so-and-so got, got convicted of a crime. Who's following the appeals? Who's going to remember, you know, 10 years from now, after all this, this hubbub with uh, Bill Cosby is over, that there was a hung jury? And who knows whether it's going to be retried again. Let's say it never gets retried. So you got a hung jury. It was 10 to 2. Most people are going to remember that there were like 40-plus women that came out and said he sexually assaulted them, even though he may never have been convicted, ever. So that's a label. Now, you all probably all have your opinions about that one, but it's just an example. You know, someone gets labeled, that label tends to stick. And of course, at sentencing, that is another cementing of that label. So the, the, the problem is, as labeling theorists see it, is that person that's been labeled throughout the process and maybe they get sentenced, they serve their time and they come out and they're trying to rejoin society, but they're now a convicted felon. And it makes it very difficult for someone who has that label of a convicted felon to get back into society, which is very important today. And there's a lot of people looking at this uh, in, the, in the case of people re-entering society from the prison system. How do we get them jobs? How do we make them productive members of society if people are totally looking at them and say, hey, well, this person robbed, you know, robbed a 7-Eleven five years ago. If I hire him, is he going to attack us? People think that kind of stuff. And in some cases, certainly, it's the right thought. But you never, you, you don't know. And there might be some people who completely turn themselves around while they were incarcerated who want to do better for themselves but might not get the opportunity because people look at them as that convicted felon. One of the things that you may be aware of on job applications, I think they did it in Philly. Uh, I forget whether it actually finally passed, but now I, they're just recently talking about doing it in, in New Jersey uh, statewide is something called the ban the box campaign. Uh, if you ever filled out a job application, one of the things that they ask you in a job application is have you ever been convicted of a crime? And it's like, I got to check yes or no. Well, what, some people believe and some studies have shown that if you check that box that you have been convicted of a crime, the employer will throw, you know, toss your, your application is, is over in the, the dead pile or in the waste bin or whatever. And they're going to go through looking for other people that don't have that box checked. So the, uh, that's a label. You're admitting to it and you're la basically labeling yourself because society labeled you ahead of time and you're not getting you know, further along. So that's what they're saying here is once that person's been defined as bad, they don't have a lot of legit legitimate opportunities. It becomes more difficult. Today, you know, there's a lot of programs that exist that are trying to change that, but certainly it still exists. Some terms that go along with labeling theory. One is primary deviance. The primary deviance is that, that first act that first thing that got you arrested, that got you uh, convicted ultimately and maybe got you sentenced, that's primary deviance. Secondary deviance is when you continue, after you've got the label, you continue to, to act in that way, especially if you have forced association with other, other offenders. Now think about this, we label somebody, we take them through the whole criminal process, they get convicted, they get sentenced, and where do we send them? We send them to a place where they get to hang out with a whole, other, whole bunch of other people that have been labeled the same way. And maybe you have the same mindset going on, or maybe you have plans about how am I going to get over uh, when I get out on the street and make some, you know, make some money, and you know, what am I going to do? What am I going to earn? And then the label gets burned in, if you will, because now not only are we labeling somebody, but when we send them to prison, we are putting them with a whole bunch of other people and we're reinforcing that label. And therefore, maybe they come out, they continue to offend. And that's the secondary deviance. Uh, society creates both deviance and deviant behavior by its res response. So the idea here, and it, it sounds a little goofy to me in, in one respect, 
is what they're saying here is that deviance doesn't exist in and of itself. Deviance exists because society says so. Now, if you want to go down to, you know, one that's being hotly debated all across the country today is possession and use of marijuana for personal use. Where it's still illegal, it's considered deviant behavior. Go to Colorado, no problem. So there you have a clear example of something that is deviant because the state says so. Labeling theorists suggest that deviance does not exist in and of itself, that all deviance is created by society. So, you know, you could say the guy who, who rapes and murders a 14-year-old, he's only deviant because the law says he is. Uh, I'm sure some of you may disagree with that. And we talked earlier in the course about the difference between, between deviance and criminality, that you know, social norms might suggest that certain things are deviant, but they're not necessarily illegal. But some people can, can get labeled because of the social norms as well. And maybe that causes them to go into a certain type of behavior because they believe people perceive them in that way. That might be an expansion of labeling, uh, if you will. So labeling theory becomes a sequence of, is, is, I'm sorry, becoming deviant is a series of steps that eventually leads to that commitment to a deviant identity and participation in a career. Is it really because of the label or is it because the continuous steps you state or is the label part of it? You know, is it possible that someone made a mistake, made a bad decision, but now because they were labeled and because they went to prison for it, their feeling about themselves, maybe their self-worth to go back to another lecture, uh, makes them continue. Moral enterprise is the idea that the efforts of a particular interest group makes to have its propriety acted into law. So you have a lot of ideas, you know, moral ideas going around in our society, whether it's, you know, the idea of, of gay marriage, whether it's, you know, how different people interact or, or are involved in our community, uh, even, even the process of the legalization or the fact that drugs are illegal, uh, prostitution, if you will considered a moral enterprise is that you have certain interest groups that don't want this type of behavior. So they push to have it made illegal. And to some degree, certain drugs and things like prostitution go there. You know, can you say uh, that prostitution in and of itself is a totally deviant act? Well, apparently in Nevada, they don't think so because it's legal in Nevada, except in the city of Las Vegas whereas pretty much in every other state in the nation, it's not. So our moral enterprise in this country for the last 200 plus years was that is something that, that we didn't want. Mark, moral ent entrepreneurs are those people who are constantly engaging in this process of moral enterprise. So concrete examples might be your uh, so-called radical right-wing folks, highly religious, conservative, pushing for uh, laws to control all kinds of different behavior that other people in society think is, is okay and normal. Becker's typology of devi deviance kind of demonstrates labeling, and he had some other terms that we want to look at. And one is the, the pure deviant. So here's somebody who they committed a crime, they intended to commit the crime, they're not doing it because of any label when they decide to continue to do it, it's not because of the label, it's because that's what they wanted to do. Or is it because of some other influence that they are, are purely deviant? So that's some, you know, another way to look at that. The pure deviant person who did the crime, maybe they do the time, and they're not gonna go do it again because of the label, they're gonna do it again because they made, say, a conscious decision they weighed the right and wrong. They, they weighed the pleasure, pleasure versus pain, as we talked about in, in, chapter, in chapter two, I believe it was, classical and neoclassical approach, you know, the purely deviant. The falsely accused de deviant, on the other hand, is that person maybe who got picked up for a crime that they didn't do. They got charged in the system, 
And on, sadly, we hear stories about this happening and having happened in major cities all over and, and in other communities. But obviously, we're here in Philadelphia region, and there's all kinds of stories about people who were uh, accused of crimes that they didn't do. And there's some people that have been released recently. And sometimes they, they lose, obviously, a big portion of their life, and they come out and they're able to rebuild. Other people convicted of crimes and then labeled may come out and start down a criminal path, even though that wasn't what they intended to do in the first place. That's labeling theory and the falsely accused deviant. Now, the secret, secret deviant, what do you think the secret deviant is? Well, you all should know because you all read the book already. But the secret deviant is that person who's committing deviant acts who's never been caught. Nobody knows. This person is not going to get labeled because nobody knows. You know, maybe it's a shoplifter who's been successful and, and never been arrested, which is rare. Uh, pretty much uh, shoplifters, unless maybe you did it once or twice and you got away with it and you changed your mind and oh, I ain't doing that no more. But you've never been labeled. That's a secret deviant. You know, you could have someone who's done things for, for many, many, many years, has never been caught, and they're a secret deviant. What if you have that, you know, whether it's a serial killer or a sex offender, you know, go to the real serious ones who have not been found or arrested yet. Until they are found, they're technically a secret, secret deviant. But there's all kinds of people in our society that would be considered secret deviants. Some of you may be right on the other end of the screen. You know, maybe you have done th something at some point in your life that was illegal or, or wrong or inappropriate or what have you, and you've never, you, you were not caught, and the only person who knows about it is you. I will acknowledge that I think it was like 12 or 13 years old, I shoplifted from a 7-Eleven. It was actually a toy gun. Here's a guy who wanted to be a cop and wanted to play cops and robbers, and I wanted to have a certain type of toy gun so much that I stole it from the store. Never caught. Technically a secret deviant, except I just acknowledged it to you, and I've admitted it in other classes as well. Uh, statute of limitations is well passed on, on that device, and I don't have it anymore, so you, may, you can't get me for possession of stolen property either. But that's a secret deviant, somebody who's done something, and they've, they've never been, had the opportunity to label. Some of those people, like myself, realizing that it was wrong, feeling guilty, will never do anything like that ever again. Others... Maybe they're secret and they're also pure because they're going to continue to do it even though nobody, uh, nobody caught them. But what these terms basically mean, pure deviant is somebody who did the crime. They're going to continue. doesn't matter that they were labeled. Falsely accused is that person that maybe never did the crime, but they were arrested and charged and therefore labeled. And maybe they continue crime because of the label. And then the secret deviant is, again, the person who is never uh, – who's – doing crimes or inappropriate things and has never been caught. So they don't get the chance to get labeled. Critiques, it doesn't really explain, labeling theory doesn't explain your origin of crime and deviance. You know, that person who gets arrested and is then labeled, why did they commit the crime in the first place? Right? If me as a 12-year-old, 13-year-old was caught shoplifting, and then I was charged. And maybe I, I went on to be a shoplifter instead of a cop. Why did I do it in the first place? Labeling theory doesn't explain that. We have to look somewhere else. Maybe one of our other theories to explain why Frankie decided to shoplift. Uh, there's not a lot of studies that support the basic tenets of the theory. There's a lack of evidence that contact with criminal justice system is detrimental to the lives of offenders because you could probably go through hundreds of anecdotal stories of people that got arrested that didn't go out and all of a sudden become criminals so there's there's not a real strong body of evidence to suggest that this theory really really uh, has some weight and there's there's some people who believe in something in the exact opposite which is the idea that the label also provides a, uh, an amount of shame that would then prevent someone because of the shame and the feeling of guilt 
from committing a crime. That would be the opposite of what the labeling theorists suggest. Doesn't say anything about secret deviance. You know, who's involved in criminality but never gets caught? Labeling theory can't say anything about that. Uh, policy implications of social process theories. So what do we do? Policy implications, remember what we're talking about with policy implications in any of the theories that we're looking at throughout the text is once we know that this is going on and we believe that this has an impact on crime, how do we then address it? Well, I just talked about uh, labeling theory and if you were to believe that labeling someone as an offender then restricts their future ability to participate in society, how do we lessen the, the impact of that label? And the ban the box campaign is one of those things is, you know, hire the person based on the merits that they prevent, present to you at the time of their application, at the time of their, their interview, you know, don't hold them, uh, don't throw them away because they did something wrong in the past. Of course, the extension of that is if, of course, you're not doing ignore criminal records if they're looking for a law enforcement job or a banking job or whatever, you know, some job that requires a criminal records check, a teacher, you're going to do that and then make the appropriate hiring decision based upon what the laws and regulations are in that. But the idea of a policy implication of banning the box is, is not having someone have to come out right away and say, hey, I, I'm a convicted offender. Social process theory suggests that crime prevention should work to enhance self-control and build pro-social bonds. So some of our, our policy implications is that we need to do things that are going to provide more control. Maybe internal controls, we're going to build values. Have, you know, we, there was a campaign in the 90s and the 2000s to have values training within our school system to increase the values of the you know, students, where you would think that, that many of people would get their values at home, but we also know that in some families that's lacking. So they bring that into the schools to try to build, to try to build that. And we also, you know, talking about building bonds, you know, getting, getting kids more involved, strengthen people's connection, getting involved in positive groups like Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, Indian Guides, somebody mentioned before, I don't even know if they still exist. Uh, the, the various sports teams, you know, getting, getting those things accessible to, to young people throughout society, and certainly things for older people, but as we, we're going to look at later on is people, offending decisions occur early on in your life. And these types of, of, of things that we do to prevent crime need to happen early on in life. We need to build those bonds. We need to put those controls in place early and then carry them through so that the person is, is going on the right life course, which we're gonna talk about what life courses are in a little bit. Now, pro-social bonds is again, attachment to conventional social institutions, values, and beliefs. Uh, one example is something that was called the juvenile mentoring program and they called it JUMP. The program places at-risk youth in a one-to-one -one relationship with favorable adult role models. And there's a lot of these, these programs. This is an example of one somewhere. And, but there's mentoring programs all over the country. And in fact, the school district that my, my wife works in, uh, they partner with a local church that has a mentoring program, and they seek out kids that might be in situations where maybe there's a single-parent household. Maybe they've been involved in some kind of juvenile issue, delinquency, whatever and they put them one-on-one -on -one with someone, and there might be other issues. Maybe they never they didn't do delinquency, but maybe there's you know poverty, maybe there's other issues. Put them in a one-on-one -on -one mentor that can help them and guide them and you know, talk about what's, what's, what's right. Think about, and it's not mentioned here, big brothers and big sisters. You've all probably heard of big brothers and big sisters. They're, they're a big presence in the Philadelphia region. Uh, there's multiple, actually they, they started merging a lot of them recently. Uh, and the one in the Philadelphia region actually takes up a, a bunch of counties. I was actively involved with one of them here in Jersey. And it, originally it was uh, Big Brothers, Big Sisters of Burlington County. Then they merged with Camden and Gloucester. It was like three counties in one. That is 
a mentoring organization where you partner somebody of the same gender with a, you know, adult with a kid and, you know, they go out on, on, on trips. They, they just go to the house and sit and talk, read books together, whatever, to provide that positive role model and relationship that is going to, uh, to help that child. Preparing for drug free years is a program uh, that you, that is, is for parents. You have parents that have kids in the ages four to eight. You have a, a program probably in the evening after everybody's home from work to help these people prepare to properly raise their child to be effective parents. Montreal Prevention Treatment Program is another one. Address early childhood risk factors for gang involvement by targeting boys in kindergarten who exhibited the disruptive behavior, which is interesting because then you're, you're identifying these kids early on, which is important because, you know, some of these behaviors you can see they start early on and someone who's really disruptive already, who's, you know, not paying attention to, to the teachers or whomever, uh, to the aides, mouthing people off, doing bad things. If they're doing it in kindergarten, it's probably only going to get worse unless we have some type of intervention before they get older. All right, all right, that's enough for labeling and also the policy implications of social process theories. When we come back, we're going to pick up on the social development perspective to explain criminality and go through you know, a bunch of different theories in there. There's a, there's a lot of material in this next one, but it's all about, about social development theories. And uh, we'll catch you when you come back.